Today I am simply delighted uh, that, that Dr. Gerard Clancy um, has been able to uh, come up from Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, to join us for the Disparity Seminar. Um, I don't know where to begin, wh whether to begin with Dr. Clancy and, and, and his interesting background or to begin with his current role. I think I'm going to begin with his current role, which is President and Dean of the Oklahoma University College of Medicine in Tulsa. It actually uh, has a new name since 2008. It's called Oklahoma University School of Community Medicine. And uh, that school has now enrolled its third class of students. Uh, thus far, 40 students to a class. It's, it's quite an unusual school, uh, probably the first of its kind in the nation, which has as an explicit purpose, uh, I mean its mission, is to improve the health status of underserved Oklahoma communities, both rural and urban. Uh, I mean, there is no medical school in the country, so far as I know, that has that as its primary mission and focus. Um, to do that, it hopes to build a community that will improve the health of individuals and of their communities through learning and research and collaboration, and to educate a whole generation of new practitioners with, with these kinds of community-based and individual skills. L listen to some of the things that, that this new school does. For example, it provides educational, it, it recruits students nationally, I should say, not, not just Oklahomans, but it's, it's a national recruitment. Um, it, it charges no cost for any courses related to public health care, which is interesting in itself. But for those courses that it does charge for, which is to say for medical education, uh, it provides educational grants and forgiveness for service, such that students can leave medical school and essentially discharge their indebtedness. I learned only last evening what the cost of medical education is today, at, uh, that is these days, at the University of Chicago. Four years of medical education in Chicago, uh, th this is um, tuition plus living expenses. Does anybody want to hazard a guess? How much? 300,000. 300,000. And our, the average indebtedness of our students coming out, I'm told, is between 170 and $180,000. So to think of a, of, a, of a class of students coming out who can discharge their debts, it, it all comes from an extraordinary endowment uh, from George Kaiser and his foundation, um, who's a local uh, philanthropist in, in Tulsa. Um, that, that is provided to the students um, uh, at, at, at the university. Um, Mr. Kaiser has as his commitments early childhood education, health care, developing a safety net for Oklahomans, and community betterment. And this is part of his health care investment. Um, so it's an, it's an extraordinary school. It, it, it has as its dean an extraordinary man in, in Dr. Clancy, um, whose training uh, was largely at the University of Iowa in psychiatry, whose research interests have included the delivery of psychiatric services uh, at the community level to the seriously mentally ill and disease management in behavioral and mental health uh, at the community level. Um, in, in Iowa City, he was known as, his program was known as Psych on a Bike. Uh, he and his students and residents would ride around on bicycles to find the homeless people of Iowa City. Iowa City has homeless people and to provide mental health services and medication on site, which is to say in the homeless areas where people lived. Um, he w he's working these days on changing the medical curriculum, changing clinical teaching experiences such that both students and residents uh, will develop the additional skills needed uh, to provide health to communities in addition to providing, as I say, health to individuals. Um, uh, Dr. Clancy has won many awards for his work, including seven Distinguished Teaching Awards. Just yesterday, in his new role, uh, quite a new role, as the new chair-elect of the Chamber of Commerce of the City of Tulsa, 
Dr. Clancy had the opportunity to spend three hours with the recently elected governor of the state of Oklahoma. Uh, her name is Mary Fallon. I expect that most of us here uh, don't know very much about Governor Fallon, except to say that she is among the most conservative uh, people elected in this last election cycle. And Oklahoma was one of the few states that had a state question on the ballot. And the state question was, should Oklahoma opt out of Obamacare and receive 70% positives to that question? So the three-hour meeting yesterday with the governor, in, in the light of her own conservative views, as well as this recent state question that was posed, uh, was a challenging meeting uh, to develop resources from the state uh, to support the kind of missions that I've talked to you about, missions of alleviating disparities uh, at the individual and community level. Well, Dr. Clancy has his work cut out for him. Today he will talk to us uh, about health disparities in Oklahoma. It's time for community medicine and will also tell us about his work at the new medical school. Remember, this is not an amplifying microphone, but a recording microphone. So as in the question and answer session, please try to have this in hand as you pose your questions. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Clancy to Chicago. Thanks, Jerry. Well, thank you for having me. I, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with the University of Chicago now for the past year. I've gotten to know Eric and Sarah Ann and Dorian, and it's, it's been a great pleasure. We've, uh, we were hosted here about last year at this time, and then, um, then we've had two conferences together, one in Tulsa and now one in Miami. And we're all, uh, uh, what, I, what I'm happy to say is we're all like-minded. It's as if uh, um, the schools that we're working on these types of initiatives, we've been working together for many years. Well, the, the name of this talk is Democratization of Health Advances in America taking it to the streets. And this is the Doobie Brothers taking it to the streets album. The first album that I bought in 1977. When I bought that album, I was a dishwasher at Howard Johnson's. The music came on and listen to this. I rode my bike downtown, cashed my check and bought an album. <laughs> None of those things we do anymore. <laughs> so that's, it's just a sign. The students have no idea what we're talking about. Um, so I'm gonna give you like a somewhat of a tour of of Oklahoma, as well as a tour of medical education and healthcare services delivery um, over the time period. But I need to introduce you a little bit to Oklahoma. So, welcome to Oklahoma. We're ranked 49th in health. And this is at the State Fair where they had the donut burger. <laughs> Two Krispy Kreme donuts with a bacon and hamburger and cheese in between. It, for, and, 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 and it was a, it was a seller. <laughs> This is an actual donut burger right there. This person and this person got mad that I took a picture with my iPhone doing that. They knew I was up to something. Well, beyond the donut burger, we also have deep fried butter, which just makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I, in butter. So we're also, ranked 40, we're also ranked 49th in health system performance as well. Clearly, Diet is an issue for us. Um, so the goals of today's talk, I'm really going to step back a little bit and, and go through a little bit of the history of health system and medical education design over the past century, the great benefits of that design, but also some of the shortcomings of how we're organized now, an opportunity within health reform legislation for democratization of those health advances, and then we'll do some case-based learning with Tulsa, Oklahoma as an example, where we've redesigned our medical education system, and we really think there's great opportunities within federal health legislation as well. So over the past hundred years, American medical education has had a great, great century. Um, in the early 1900s, medical education in America was a disaster. It was not well organized at all. And, uh, Sir Osler came together and started formalizing how medical education pathways um, would follow. And the Flexner Report came out 100 years ago, and it really married medical education to research and quality improvement. There was a formula for excellence in research and specialization, and over the next 100 years you saw tremendous growth 
of academic health centers. I myself was born in an academic center, health center at the University of Iowa, a wonderful, beautiful place. I was educated there and um, did most of my um, early career at the University of Iowa. At the same time, Alpha Omega Alpha, the honorary student uh, society was established really to um, <coughs> create a bar for students to, to shoot for as far as academic and professional excellence as well. So we've really had a hundred years of tremendous, tremendous aspirations for excellence in, in um, medical education and services. <coughs> this has contributed, not solely responsible, but contributed to a 30-year advancement in life expectancy in America. That's tremendous. Um, medical education has, be, has become very hospital focused during that time period and revenues are highest in specialties, manual interventions and hospitals. That's how you make money in healthcare. You don't make money in primary care. Um, students are selected that can thrive in this environment and that can afford this environment as, as Dr. Siegler talked about. Uh, and students emulated what they saw. We've seen tremendous growth and fellowship uh, program development really in more and more super subspecialty areas. So here's some trends in federal funding over the past 30 years or so. You see that research dollars have had a nice steady growth in America uh, up to about 16 billion per year now. Um, graduate medical education funding, the dollars that go to the hospitals that then go to pay for uh, resident education including our stipends has had a, in general a nice steady growth as well. But Title VII programs, pro programs that are really public medical care infrastructure, have not done very well over the past 30, 30 years or so. They peaked in the 1970s and really is, has been a relatively steady decline over the past several um, decades, and we're starting to see the effects of that. Um, as good as the past century has been, we really do have room for improvement. And as I go out and talk to governors and such, um, I talk about the, what I call the four C's of health reform. Whenever we start talking about health reform, there are some, some things that get pushed to the side as far as reasons for health reform that you have to bring back into the spotlight. It is very important. First of all, cost of health care in America is very high compared to other countries. We definitely have coverage issues as far as who is insured and who is not insured. We do not have enough clinicians to carry the load as we go forward and care quality and efficiency is not good enough. And we'll go over each one of these uh, quickly. So let's go over cost first. Healthcare in America has steadily increased over the past 25 years at a rate much greater than other developed countries. These are the developed countries. This is gross domestic product over the past 25 years. This is spending per capita over the past 25 years. You see the U.S. in turquoise pulling away from the rest of developed world as far as healthcare spending. So our health care costs are, <clears throat> are escalating compared to others. Coverage wise, we certainly have insurance design issues where individuals can reach their lifetime limits. I'm a psychiatrist, people reach their lifetime limits commonly. <clears throat> you can be kicked out for pre-existing conditions and you can be canceled for coverage if your health care costs become uh, too great. We most definitely have coverage issues as well. We have 47 million Americans who are not covered in Oklahoma. That's 650,000 people out of 3 million. <clears throat> in the Tulsa area, we have 150,000 uninsured out of a, a, um, a population of 750,000. So one in five are uninsured. <clears throat> when Eric and I went through medical school, we didn't know about this research. But um, you, you worried about it when you were in residency. But now we know it by funding from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, individuals without health care coverage are twice as likely to be diagnosed late with cancer as compared to individuals with health care coverage. And if you look at these cancers, prostate, breast, melanoma, and colorectal, they all have a screening tool. If you look at these cancers, each one when caught early can be treated through surgery or chemotherapy. If you look at each one of them, if caught late, very, very difficult to treat. So it really is <coughs> a, a, a moral crisis that we have ways to, tr to identify these cancers, we have ways to treat these cancers, and still people are dying of these cancers. Let's talk a little bit about clinicians. The U.S. is going to be somewhere between 125,000 and 150,000 physicians short in the next 10 years. <clears throat> we have an increasing population. We have an increase in life expectancy. The baby boomers have an increase in demand. In general, over the past uh, several decades, medical school class sizes have gone down until recently. <clears throat> we have a new group of physicians that I call living off the grid who have decided they're going to do cash-only business. In, in Tulsa, we have 
uh, several doctors who used to carry 2,000 patients have trimmed that down to just 500 and have told those other 1,500 to go find a doctor somewhere else. And the business that they, <clears throat> the 500 that they care for, pay a subscription fee annually that they're in their, their special club. Um, Oklahoma is also 49th in the country in uh, primary care physicians. Care quality and efficiency. We have some high cost populations who are getting very questionable care. I was just telling Eric, I just got back from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. <clears throat> Had some great talks with them. The area that they are most concerned with right now is a population that they call duals. These individuals are, are eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. They are poor and disabled or poor and old. Nine million people cost Medicare and Medicaid $350 billion. <coughs> they average $40,000 per patient per year in this population, with the average in the United States is about $6,000 per year. This group is not well managed, and it's clear that they're not getting very good care either. This is going to be a target, one of the first things that will roll out as far as health reform, as far as practice <coughs> on the streets. There's also great evidence that really we have a group of diseases that get readmitted over and over. Uh, congestive heart failure, COPD, diabetes, and in my field, psychiatry, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. <coughs> when we talked to our residents, we polled our residents, they're very frustrated that these populations come in and out of the hospital, in and out of the hospital, and they don't have a good outpatient system to go to for them. Here's some examples of heart disease rates. This is heart disease mortality <coughs> over a four-year period. The more intense red, the higher the heart disease mortality. You can't even see the borders of Oklahoma. We're, <laughs> we're obliterated. <coughs> and you can't even see Mississippi. We're, we're 49th in health status. Mississippi is 50th. So with what you've seen so far is just my introduction with the donut burger and the the uh, fried cheese, where do you think Oklahoma ranks when quality of care is plotted against cost of care? Do you think we're a, a low cost, high quality state? Do you think we're a high cost, low quality state, or somewhere in between? Northeast, northwest, southeast, or southwest? Where do you think we're at? <coughs> well, this is Commonwealth Fund and, um, uh, and um, United Health Foundation. Southeast. Southeast. You are correct. We rank last in health system performance with some measures of quality uh, and health status baked in there. Here's Illinois, by the way, right there. There's Oklahoma. And we're a relatively high cost state as far as Medicare beneficiaries. Um, the more intense green, the higher cost of Medicare enrolling. Um, <clears throat> and when you plot it, there we end up, we end up down in the southeast corner. That's where we are. And here's Illinois, by the way. Um, I, I didn't want to do a red because that would confuse you with OU, and I, so I just put the, the Illinois red, but I'm, I'm certainly not a University of Illinois fan here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's move to health reform legislation. We just had the December or the November elections, and there's a lot of things up in the air. <clears throat> what most people don't realize is actually we have three active health reform bills in play right now. The first is the Affordable Care Act uh, that was passed in March. But the stimulus bill itself passed a year previous to that is loaded with health reform. <clears throat> then we have the 1944 Public Health Services Act, which has been modified over and over and over again. So there's a lot of legislation in the airs. And even if this is gone after, these are well down the road. So health reform is going to roll out. <clears throat> Those came together, passed into law, and now the agencies at Health and Human Services, including CMS, AHRQ, CDC, and HRSA, are working through all the mandates that come, came from legislation and putting them into policies and procedures. <coughs> this is a very busy time at those agencies. <coughs> they have a huge amount of work to do, and they have a huge amount of control on how this will all roll out. The health reform basics <coughs> that was talked about the most were health care coverage and insurance reform. Health care coverage, the mandate that 32 million will be now covered, 50% through Medicaid, 
That's where everybody's getting angry, at least in Oklahoma. Don't tell me what to do. <clears throat> the insurance reform limits, not too much, uh, too much arguing about that in the general population. I was doing grand rounds at the University of Iowa um, right after the health reform bill was passed, and uh, someone handed me the health reform legislation in five-point font, about that thick. And they said, here, read this on the way. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I took it with me. <clears throat> I was stranded in the Minneapolis airport on the way there for seven hours and stranded on the, in the Minneapolis airport six hours on the way home. I had 13 hours with nothing to do. I read the health reform bill. Um, <clears throat> what I was amazed with was how much was not being talked about that was in the bill and um, really um, how well it actually came together. So in the bill is a lot of... Of, of efforts around workforce, expanding public health, nursing, physician assistance, nursing, primary care, and federally qualified health centers. A huge, huge amount on expanding access, access to care, <clears throat> primarily through the FQHCs. A lot of efforts on changing reimbursement around quality of care, changing reimbursement around efficiency of care, <clears throat> changing reimbursement to bundle care together, where primary care and specialty care and pharmacy and nursing and occupational therapy and extended care afterwards all comes together. One of the best examples of that is <clears throat> for a hip replacement now, um, there are pilots out there that 30 days of health care is paid for in one chunk. You have the hospitalization, but you have the pre-hospitalization workup and the post-hospitalization care all bundled together. And we're doing one of those pilots in, in Tulsa and everybody's happy with it. <clears throat> There's much, much greater detection of fraud, waste and abuse. There are faster transitions from research to care. <clears throat> and the most exciting part is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which allows communities to come together as far as creativity in healthcare design and payment. That's a really, really wonderful opportunity for communities to control their own destiny. <clears throat> this is a curve that I'm using frequently with our faculty to explain to them how things are going to change dramatically in the next five to six years. <coughs> right now, healthcare Revenue is based off of volume, procedures, specialty care, hospital care, and what you negotiate with the insurance companies. What the health reform legislation does <clears throat> is makes payment based off quality, efficiency, performance, bundling or working together, and actually reducing expenses. <clears throat> we call this transition from here to over here life in the gap because it's going to be a very confusing time for hospitals, for physician groups, for the students that are um, um, going into residency, you're going to be living this. For the residents that are going into practice, you're going to be living in the gap very, very soon. It's already starting. And there will be a lot of ups and downs and a lot of confusion as to exactly how will this roll out. For us, life in the gap, what we see is we're going to go from talk about health reform to actually implementing health reform. <coughs> We're going to go from a lot of uninsured in Oklahoma to many newly insured, 100,000 individuals with health care coverage coming into the system. We're going to go from individual practitioners to team-based care. We're going to go from paper to the electronic medical record to now health information exchange. We're going to go from volume-based care to care based off of performance, quality, and efficiency. We're going to go from fee-for-service to bundle payments. <clears throat> and we'll go from distance relationships with the payers to actually the payers being partners with us. Eric, when I was at CMS, surprisingly, Medicare said, we want to partner with you. I never thought I would ever hear that. I mean, Medicare was something you just didn't deal with. You didn't talk to, you didn't, they were a big building over in Rockville and you didn't work with them. They want to work with us now. So let's talk a little bit about Tulsa. How will this roll out in Tulsa? <clears throat> well, Tulsa's history is very important. In 1921, we had the darkest, worst day ever possible in Tulsa. We had a terrible race riot where Caucasian Tulsa went across the tracks and burned down uh, what was called Black Wall Street, which is a very affluent, successful part of town and um, really wiped out any momentum that the African-American population had in Tulsa. Um, estimated that 300 people were killed in, in this, and this community of Tulsa is not over it yet. There is divide in our community. This is just underneath the service, and we have not healed on this as of yet. <coughs> and so understanding that is vital for us to actually start working on some of our terrible health disparities that we have in Tulsa. 
our College of Public Health started giving us zip code data on where are the differences in health status in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And the first thing that they came up with is that <clears throat> between North Tulsa and South Tulsa, we have a 14-year difference in life expectancy, which is dramatic. So I live right here in 74114. This is a five-mile difference to 74106, 14-year difference in life expectancy. Dramatic. <clears throat> At the same time, Northeast and West Tulsa have about 40% of the population, but they only have 44% of the clinicians. <clears throat> our number one reason for patients not showing up to our, import, our, our clinic appointments, transportation issues. And the clinics are all down here is where they are, but the patients in need are up here. So we've got a terrible maldistribution. So why do we have a 14-year difference? <clears throat> On the surface, you'd say cancer, heart disease, stroke are three times uh, higher than the national average. It's a lifestyle choice and it's poverty. But as you start understanding the community, you actually learn that we have some terrible policies in the state. We have a very pro-tobacco state. We have a rule called preemption that no community can have a tobacco restriction more conservative, more serious than the state laws. So if a community wants to come together and say, we want to ban smoking in the entire community, you can't do it in Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, we talked a little bit about the, the strong desire. 73% of the population voted to opt out of uh, health reform. We can say diet, but it's really access to good food and cost to, of good food. We can talk about exercise, but it's really a safety issue. <clears throat> we can talk about access, but it's really a transportation issue. And we can talk about infrastructure, but it's really failed infrastructure in Oklahoma where we haven't taken advantage of the opportunity to build FQHCs, economic development, and do a better job with our schools. Um, our students run a evening walk-in clinic. They've been running it since 2003. It runs um, <clears throat> about 10 hours a week. And I was shocked when, when someone came in with, with this, and we had our derm clinic going, and I said, Dr. Adelson, what is that? He says, that's squamous cell carcinoma. That started as an actinic keratosis. That started as a little scabby thing that ni liquid nitrogen would have frozen off, that even me as a psychiatrist could have done that procedure effectively. Um, and instead, she waited two and a half years. So this is what, when we learned in med school, squamous cell carcinoma is really not that dangerous unless you sit on it. This, this woman sat on it because she had no health care coverage. It's now infected. <clears throat> it's, she now has osteomyelitis, and she'll receive a partial amputation from something very, very simple. <clears throat> We did an analysis of where are we short on visits, and in our area we were 130,000 patient visits short a year, <clears throat> primarily in specialty care. We were 90,000 short on specialist visits compared to what we should have been doing as far as reaching the underserved. So that was the start of our <clears throat> pushing into renaming the medical school the School of Community Medicine. Phase one was really all about access, and we, we put together more primary care outreach clinics. And then we put together an initiative for, to put specialty care in those zip codes that had no access to specialty care in the outpatient setting. Then we started working on workforce. <clears throat> we added a physician assistant program. And now we've, we've added a four-year track within the bigger College of Medicine uh, with the explicit commitment to improve the health of the entire community. Now we're working on model patient care and teaching environment <clears throat> within health reform legislation. Our belief is that we're going to have to modify how we deliver health care to have a model teaching environment for our medical students. We don't want to have a teaching environment that is archaic to compared to where health care is going to be soon. So we're rapidly trying to change how we deliver health care. <coughs> this is not totally out of line. Case Western put together in partnership with Cleveland Clinic the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. This is a special themed medical school. Really, we're looking at biomedical research. We thought to ourselves, let's do something similar. Let's do a special themed medical school around service to the underserved. So some of the things we've done is we've developed an outreach network of clinics. We have 19 uh, clinics in elementary schools across the region that serve another uh, a total of 32 schools. <clears throat> those clinics, we see a lower ER utilization among those, those uh, families going to those clinics, lower absentee rates in school, lower family mobility, and increased test scores for the kids that have the clinics in them because the kids stay in school. 
We developed our traditional hospital-based services and our traditional clinics, but we also have a huge amount of outreach clinics and special programs for special populations. So we, we have 346 docs doing 98 specialized programs at 52 sites across the region. We call it the Starbucks model of healthcare. We have something on every, every corner. The, the most complicated one we're working on right now is our HealthPlex, which is putting an advanced outpatient clinic in the heart of the underserved area where we can do chemotherapy, urgent care, cardiac care, but not hospital care. <clears throat> Off hospital location, we think we can do about 70% of what an ER can do. <clears throat> we'll bring surgery, oncology, and cardiology to that population that's struggling. <clears throat> we'll, uh, we're, it's under construction now. It's called the Wayman Tisdale specialty health clinic. If any of you are NBA basketball fans, Wayman Tisdale from North Tulsa <coughs> died last year from bone cancer. He was a great jazz musician as well, but we named the clinic after him. So things are going along great. We're thinking we're in great condition. Um, we start putting formalization to the medical school, medical student experience. We have a four-year track within the bigger college. We recruit for altruism. And surveys show that in the environment we're teaching the students, altruism is holding up. We're comparing ourselves to the other track within the medical school. Altruism is diving. Um, we have scholarships for services for all specialties. We have uh, an, an MPH program integrated in. Students start medical school with what, a six-day course called the Summer Institute, where we teach them the anatomy of the community before they learn the anatomy of the body, so they understand who they will be serving. We have two student-run clinics. <clears throat> One is an acute care clinic in the evenings, and the other is longitudinal team-based care where the third and fourth year students will have the same panel of patients over those two years. And they do it with the nursing, <clears throat> pharmacy, and social work students as a team. Um, then the day-to-day -day environment out and about in the community, and then they have research capstones on community health as well. We're all feeling good. Things are going great. And then things changed dramatically for us last year, uh, earlier this year. In one week's time, we got a very negative newspaper article on OU's Tisdale Clinic from the North Tulsa newspaper, fa citing failure of OU's leadership. It was the same week we were doing the groundbreaking on the Tisdale Clinic. We were scheduled with the Tisdale family coming in from across the country. The mayor was there, <coughs> president of the bigger university. It was also the same week that I was scheduled to be the Grand Marshal of the Martin Luther King Parade. So I'm stressed out, big time. And the faculty said, what are we going to do? And I said, folks, this is what community medicine is. <laughs> community medicine is being out and about in the community and, and listening and weathering. Well, here's a little excerpt from that newspaper article. The title was, Is Tulsa North Being Pimped by OU? To Tulsa North's rescue, Oklahoma University has come. <clears throat> Unquestionably, med medical care is needed in Tulsa North. Why then pose such a negative question when OU appears to be doing the right thing? Our answer, pimps use the bodies of women to make money. <clears throat> For whatever reason, the women are vulnerable. The residents of Tulsa North are very vulnerable because of their poor health outcomes. Hundreds of millions of dollars will be spent ostensibly for better health care <clears throat> for North Tulsa. Who gets the money for such an endeavor? OU will. Who receives $20 million for building the facility? Manhattan Construction. If a healthy community is the goal of OU, does it not recognize that a healthy community involves more than improving traditional health care facilities and services? A healthy community must have a good economy, a chance for good jobs for its residents. Tulsa North's personal sense of well-being and its ability to thrive socially and economically are tied together. It's impossible to have a healthy community without a strong educational and economic engine in its midst. Why do we pose the question, is Tulsa North being pimped by OU? Do not pimp used bodies to get income. OU will receive income from treating sick bodies. When will OU learn that the elimination of health care disparities among population groups is not a zero-sum game? How do you think the faculty and leadership responded? We got mad, 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 you know? We got mad. I couldn't help it. I, oh. but, I was, but also mixed in the mad was embarrassed and uh, definitely, uh, boy, we, we weren't listening to something.
boy, we, 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 this is a big lesson for us to learn. Uh, when we met with the legislators and the leaders of North Tulsa and the writers of the article, <clears throat> the key line was, you don't get it. We want you to bring the full resources of University of Oklahoma to help us, not just clinics. Bring business, bring architecture, bring education. <clears throat> Make it so North Tulsa companies build the clinic. And this has really been a, a turning point for our medical school and for our campus. The leadership of OU, including President Bourne, is really engaged now. It was, it was a call to arm, it was a wake up call. Um, we've worked a lot with Penn in Philadelphia, Broader University, and they, they had similar experiences where there was, there was a crisis of, of, of conscience and culture at one point. And the question was, are you going to work through it or are you gonna back off? They worked through it, we worked through it, and we're much better for it. So we really changed our architecture of our campus and our medical school. Of course we are working on access to care, of course, we are working on workforce. Of course, we are working on safety, quality, and efficiency. <clears throat> but we started working on linking our efforts to the broader determinants of health. Education, urban design, economic development, safety, literacy, and early childhood. And we're a much better school for it. <clears throat> we, we, we now integrate within our medical school initiatives our early childhood programs, our urban design programs, <clears throat> pharmacy works on health literacy, our social work works on family stabilization, um, um, and it, it has been much better for us as we've gone forward. So groundbreaking day did happen in that week, and it was all a happy event. It was really almost a healing, a healing day where more leaders in Tulsa were in North Tulsa than have been there in probably 90 years. It was really a great day. This is <clears throat> Regina Tisdale, the wife of Wayman Tisdale. This is Wayman's uh, brother, Weldon Tisdale, the lead pastor in North Tulsa, a wonderful, wonderful man. <clears throat> These are legislators. This is Tedra Williams, our clinical nurse manager for the Tisdale Clinic. Her granddad was a race riot survivor. Um, it's the mayor. Uh, just a great day. This is the, the um, Martin Luther King Day Parade. Had a great day. Um, <clears throat> And we started actually paying greater attention to all the different initiatives beyond the medical school that we were working with in improving economic vitality within our um, community. Um, the f we, we changed how we build the building. Instead of just putting things out for bid like the normal university uh, policy is, we gave points for local participation. <clears throat> the highest amount of local participation for construction of clinics or any buildings in North Tulsa in the past had been 6%. We got it to 24%, which was very good. The city councilor called it a game changer. Um, new pharmacy next door to where the clinic will be. Uh, we started a new initiative called Taste of North Tulsa that highlighted all the, the restaurants as far as healthy food options. That was a great event. And our urban design studio is now working with community members on redesign in the community for a much healthier community, and it's been a great experience as well. On health reform, there are some big opportunities as far as payment modifications that will line things up um, and hopefully get the incentives in the right place as well. We talked a little bit about this at the beginning. Um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is going to be look at, looking at special populations that are at risk. So um, when I was psyched on a bike, the name of our program was called IMPACT. And we provided uh, daily outreach care to a group of patients with very, very severe mental illness that were just on the edge of not being able to live independently in the community. We had an interdisciplinary team of doctors, nurses, social workers, substance abuse specialists, and actually client peers. We go out and do that care daily. And the, the nice thing was we pretty quickly reduced symptoms, improved independent living abilities, improved patient satisfaction, and we saved the system $15,000 per patient per year by delivering care differently than before. The feds are now going to be looking for the same thing with this dual, uh, dual eligible program, uh, dual eligible population. Um, opportunities for the University of Oklahoma, opportunities for the University of Chicago right now are significant within health reform legislation, <coughs> and they really fall into three buckets. The first is the federal agency called HRSA is putting $11 billion into health workforce expansion, physician loan payback, and clinic uh, expansion. 
The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is putting $10 billion into initiatives that decrease costs, increase efficiency, increase quality. <clears throat> and then CMS, with local or with state Medicaid programs, will ensure roughly uh, 32 million uh, Americans across the country. Well, we use that as our, our starting point to put together our strengths of our community to then hopefully build a much more rational health care delivery system in Tulsa. But the bottom line is our goal is to create a, create a model health care delivery system for teaching the next generation of clinicians. So getting back to where we were with democratization. This is age-adjusted death rate over the past 25 years. Death rate in the United States has dropped very nicely, a 30% improvement in death rate in the past 25 years. The age-adjusted death rate in Oklahoma has only improved 11%. Something happened in 1992 or before that that we started diverging from the rest of the country. I can't answer what that is, but it's probably multiple, multiple factors. <clears throat> but it's clear whatever is happening across the nation as far as improvement of health, we're not enjoying it in Oklahoma. So one of our missions is to catch up. <clears throat> Last week at the AAMC, <coughs> Dr. <coughs> Fitzhugh Mullen. Yep, yep. Dr. Mullen really got national attention earlier this year because he put out an article <coughs> in Annals of Internal Medicine that ranked medical schools by their ability to meet social mission. Well, he was really a popular speaker this year at the AAMC, which is shows that people have great interest in what he's saying. But his closing comment was, in the 20th century, science and medicine combined to create great benefit for humankind, leading to a 30-year expanded life expectancy. The imperative of the 21st century is the democratization of those benefits, so making sure everybody gets the benefit of those improvements. So my, my famous quote after that is, Health reform legislation provides an opportunity to begin that democratization. With underserved communities like Tulsa, New Orleans, South Central LA, Southside Chicago, Detroit, Camden, probably standing to benefit the most if we can get organized. And I think that's a great topic for, for this series, which, which starts with ethics. And this is, this is ethics of populations. Okay. Well, I hope that was entertaining. If you don't mind, I would just like to hear more narrative about the, uh, the, the article that you referenced. And were, I mean, were you completely blindsided by it, or had, had people reached out? And I mean, it seems like it was very strong on opinion. So was it reported, or was it an op-ed, or was it a? It, it, was a, it was a front page story. <clears throat> I was tipped off to it the night before. Um, and I, I, I think um, the intent, it was very um, intentional in when it was planned to really draw attention. And it was very successful um, in doing so. I mean, we really responded to it. Rather than <clears throat> trying to minimize it, trying to ignore it, we had no choice but to recognize it. With, with those two big events coming, Martin Luther King Parade and the, the groundbreaking, it needed to be addressed. And I, I thought it was actually brilliant uh, as far as how they timed it. Since Mark uh, mentioned you had a three-hour conversation with your conservative governor, I'd love to hear more about uh, what that involved, if you'd be willing, and, and how you expect the future to go forward, given this scenario. That's a great question. <clears throat> and it it, it kind of starts with, um, I think, of, of many of the of, uh, of all the medical specialties, um, one of the most misunderstood is psychiatry in the first place. So I'm used to being misunderstood in the first place. Um, and when you sit down and explain to people what psychiatric illness really is, and when you sit down and explain to people what psychiat psychiatric treatment is like, they get an aha moment. I think that's where we are with explaining to the general population the health status of America, how out of step we are with other countries and what opportunities are there to improve things. So my conversations with our very conservative Oklahoma legislators, all of them are very conservative except for Dan Bourne, um, has really been 
educating them first and foremost of, you know, there's a lot of benefit in here. Um, rather than being so philosophically for or against, take some time and look at all the benefit that's in here. Um, Eighty percent of what the Republicans wanted in the health reform legislation ended up in the legislation. I mean, there was a huge amount of overlap, right? I mean, I mean there really was. So, you know, so my greatest frustration is <clears throat> this is not about logic. This is not about um, um, what's best. This is still political maneuvering. And unfortunately, health care is being played as one of those pawns in political, mover, uh, political movements, <clears throat> and we need to make it a moral issue. We really do. Um, I, I, if you think about this country, every 50 or 60 years, this country gets itself ready to take on a major civil rights initiative, from, from independence to uh, um, women's rights to uh, civil rights. Every, every generation or so, we take on something that is significant as far as civil rights movement. And maybe, um, you know, the unfairness of health, is, maybe we're ready for that as a country. I, I'm, I'm, certain, I'm certain that you and Eric and Sarah Ann and Dorian have spoken about ways in which your program and Tulsa and our program here on the South Side might, might um, intersect. I wonder if, if you could say just a few words about that. Um, this really was, <clears throat> was started by Eric. Eric um, <clears throat> invited me in um, September of um, 2009 to be part of the um, University of Chicago's um, set of symposiums on education and health care in Washington, D.C. last year. And, um, he, brought to, he invited me, he invited Joe Greer from Florida International, a physician who had won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And um, when we three got together, it was as if we'd known each other for 20 years as far as what was important to us. You have Joe Greer coming? That's, I, get ready. Um, <laughs> he's, a, he's a lot more entertaining than I am. Um, but from that, we said, we need to get together. And what Florida International is trying to do, what you're trying to do, what we're trying to do is very similar. <clears throat> Eric knew people at New Orleans at Tulane. I knew people at New Orleans and Tulane, so we invited Tulane as well. Um, Rand Corporation um, knew Eric, and Eric knew Rand. Rand suggested Wayne State University in Detroit as well, and Charles Drew University, UCLA, in South Central LA. So we have um, six communities that really are have urban underserved populations with medical schools embedded in them that those medical schools really have an opportunity to play a leadership role in raising the health of that population through their clinical services but also creating a new generation of physicians that are ready to take care of that population and it's a really lofty goal we've come together twice now as far as summits they've gone very well and as, it, as, as they've gone well, we're, people are hearing about it and, and wanting to join in. Now, Denver, University of Colorado wants to join, and um, Camden, the new medical school at Camden, wants to join. So we think we're on to something as far as at least one arm of what medical school leadership should be taking on. Okay. Yeah, you know, kind of like, kinda like uh, Case Western Cleveland Clinic, not every medical school needs to do everything incredibly well. You can have themes, you can take on submissions within the broader mission and do it very well. I just wanted to, to find out what lessons you, you've learned from being a part of the Oklahoma University of Oklahoma system and taking this particular focus and, and, and you know, is there things that you could teach us? And secondly, you've been, I would say, blessed by having a benefactor who you know, wrote a lot, very large check, endowed faculty that allowed you to recruit people from all over the country. Uh, and to what extent do we have to look for those kind of angels as opposed to getting, you're a state school and you yeah. likely wouldn't have gotten funding through state channels. Yeah, you know, how, how do we replicate this? How do we, so that's a great question, Eric. How do, how do you go forward with this? Um, <clears throat> Starting point for us was <clears throat> was um, data driven, understanding the data, the health of status of the community by data. But 
That alone was not enough. We also needed to understand the emotion, the culture, and the history of the community as well. So the traditional <clears throat> knee-jerk response of most academic institutions is data-driven, we're right, we're really smart people, we'll take care of things. But, but if you slow down and listen to the community and learn the history, learn the culture, and get real feedback, now you've got good balance. You've got good data and you've got understanding. So I think that was lesson number one is those two have to, have to integrate with each other. Um, the, the second lesson, I think, is um, you've got to tell the story over and over and over again. Um, so this, this is a brand new talk. I can give them this talk tomorrow at, at, at for the um, Oklahoma Hospital Association. Now, they're going to get glazed over on this real quick, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, but um, we're going to give the, 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 the speech. So you have to be very repetitive in the, um, the, the talk. I think the third getting to funding is the ability to talk with multiple leaders at multiple levels. So we've talked to CMS, we've talked to the AAMC, um, I'm in the Chamber of Commerce, I'm talking to the governor, and you've got to talk it to multiple, multiple um, power brokers. Uh, I think it's an important lesson. <clears throat> um, I think the next lesson is you've got to go where the money is. And right now the money's not at the states. The states have no money. Um, private philanthropy is coming up a little bit right now. They've had a pretty good year. So there's some money back with private philanthropy and clearly there's money at the federal level as far as opportunity for at least seeding funding to go forward. So I think those are some of our lessons. Good question. Yes, sir. It seems to me that um, part of the problem is in the funding stream, that if you have the majority of funding through private for-profit organizations, you will always have disparities. Um, have you looked at, first, there are some states that are experimenting, or at least there are some proposals for single payer systems, and what, have you looked at other payment mechanisms other than bundling and efficiency that might decrease specifically disparities? Um, I mean, I mean, if, if everybody was paid equally, uh, physicians were paid equally all over the city, they would go where the business is. The business is here. You know, everybody's here is sick. Yeah. I, I, th I think that's a great question as well. <clears throat> we're just starting to dip our toe into, uh, it's kind of our, so I showed those different pots that we're working on, access, workforce, quality, safety, efficiency, <clears throat> linking to the broader determinants of health. That's our next chapter that we're just getting into is how do we work with payment to make it work right. Um, fortunately, we're, we're a relatively small state. Oklahoma's got 3.1 million people. Um, Oklahoma Medicaid really likes what we're doing, so, they, so we, we think we can um, really do some creative things with Oklahoma Medicaid. <coughs> Oklahoma Blue Cross Blue Shield really likes us as well. So we've got two major payers, but what exactly we'll do, I don't know yet. Uh, I mean, it's a great question of how do you align incentives to get the right behaviors out of the clinicians and the right behaviors out of the patient. Now, I, don't, I don't think anybody's cracked that nut yet. No. I think that Obama mantra of keep hope alive is uh, when you think about educators who's been trying to keep students and <coughs> residents in working in underserved community it's keeping altruism alive and so how do you keep that going in medical school what are the things you do to keep that going great question yeah question is how, how do you keep that altruism alive um, uh, several layers um, the student that really has the calling in the first place, <clears throat> that's helpful. Student that altru altruism is not new to them, so that, that's, that's helpful. Um, the environment that the students learn in is key. That you have to, you can't talk one way and walk another way. You have to walk and talk the same way on this. Um, I think the very first days of medical school are very important. It's as if you go back in childhood and they are very formative years. I remember the first day of medical school like it was yesterday. I mean, I was so nervous and so amped up and I mean, I'm, I remember it very, very well. So the, first, the, the setting the tone on the very first days is very important. Dr. Siegler and I talked about this. There needs to be greater attention to the career paths that altruistic physicians want to follow. 
And it was the start of our loan payback program. Why penalize someone who wants to be altruistic and do good work? They're not asking for a whole bunch of money, but they're asking to be at least taken care of somewhat as far as debt. Um, I also think we have to pay great attention to the patient care teaching environment that those faculty are in so that they can do it for the long run. I think it's one of the areas that the federally qualified health centers across the country and the National Health Service Corps have struggled with is that they have not paid attention to the environment you're going to be in. One of my good friends in medical school was sent to northern uh, North Dakota, right on the Canadian North Dakota border, and he's bitter still about it. It was a terrible, terrible experience for him. And um, whereas I did my Air Force time in Rapid City, South Dakota, and had a great experience because the team that I was with. I was, I was not isolated. I had a great, great experience with that. I do think um, pairing academics and service together is, is a nice combination. I'm in academics because I love the students. My wife knows when I've had a good day because I've been with the students. She goes, you've been with the students today, haven't you? Because I'm, I'm in a better mood. Um, and that happens to almost every academician. The more time you have with the students, they are just uplifting. They're, they're the next generation. They are wonderful. They are eager. They keep you on your toes. And I think pairing service with medical education is a wonderful combination that gets ignored. There's a, within the health reform legislation is a new set of um, programs for the FQHCs to become teaching health centers. And no one's really, uh, Waco has done it well, uh, Boise has done it well, and Billings have done it well as far as family medicine residency programs. Um, but it looks like they want to do more of those. Um, and I think that's a real important piece to take care of. Good question. Though. I work a lot with our medical students on campus and some of their extracurricular activities. And I know that your campus is shaped a little different. I know a lot of the stuff that you guys probably do are very service driven. I was wondering if there was any unique or um, just interesting extracurricular activity that your students are doing that isn't necessarily part of your direct medical education, but it's one of your strongest programs. Um, no, I, you know, our, our, our students have a choice of going into the traditional program or our track. I think those that, those that choose our track in the first place are a little bit more risk takers, uh, maybe a little bit more mature. Um, they're de very committed in the first place um, to doing it. <coughs> They really own our student-run clinics, and, and um, we staff those clinics with physician volunteers. The faculty come in as volunteers, and we put it on the students to do the recruitment of, of the, the faculty, and boy, do they get ticked off if um, they get mad at the faculty. So I, I think those are some of the pieces that are unique. Um, but as far as extracurricular activities, um, we, we really let the students kind of take care of it. Um, I, don't, I don't meddle too much. Good questions. Yes. This, this is a bit unrelated to the, the what you want us to take home from this conversation. But earlier in the presentation, when you talked about the cash only uh, practices and how doctors were some of them moving towards that, I'm wondering what happens to those patients um, when they need surgeries or something more that's not with their primary care doctor or something like how does that how do they account for that in the system because surgeries and emergent care are very expensive and I, I just how do they how do they figure that out I guess my short question well the patients don't come off the grid as I call it so they're still insured <clears throat> so the patient pays a fifteen hundred dollar a year subscription fee that he is in that physician's club but they still have their commercial insurance so those physicians are clearing between five hundred thousand and a million dollars before they see a patient just by having the patient in the club. Then insurance is billed on top of that. What we've seen is six or seven docs have done it in our local area that um, previously had about 2,000 patients in their panel. They went down to 500. Those 1,500 that got left out are desperate to find a doctor. It's really tough, really tough right now. Jerry. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the viewpoint from either the Tulsa Department of Public Health or even the state of Oklahoma and your approaches to community medicine and uh, their thoughts about health disparities and health outcomes? Um, great question, Dorian. Um, our, our Department of Health locally, our county Department of Health, has actually gone from 
really being a provider of primary care and, and actually downsize that dramatically. They really are in surveillance, vaccination um, um, roles right now, and they've not really decided to get back into healthcare. So they've almost become a, a non-factor as far as um, delivery of healthcare. Um, they, they are with us in the schools on the prevention side of things. Um, but it's, it's, um, we struggle to really work well with them um, so far. We, we've not been able to, to accomplish that one yet. We're not there yet. The, the state health department, um, what we did was hire one of their uh, associate directors as a part-time faculty member with us to, have to, to create those relationships so things would start going. Um, we'd be planning together. So we just started into that. Um, I had a question about the, tr the different tracks. How, do, how is there cross-pollination between the sort of community tracks and the traditional med students? Because you worry that there's this dynamic group of people who are like really on fire and really motivated and mature who never interact with their peers to sort of get them there or to expose them to it. Well, they're back and forth to Tulsa and Oklahoma City a fair amount. So that, that, and they do know each other well uh, that way. They do, they do um, a, lot of co, a lot of coursework together in the first place, not as, as if they're <coughs> entirely separated. Um, what has happened is that as the, the community medicine track has, has done new things, the other track has said, well, we want to do it as well. So it's actually stimulated them to, to do things alongside that, so there's not much of a difference. LCME right now, we're still, still uh, accredited as a track within the medical school, so the LCME does not let us get too far away from what they're doing anyhow. Can I ask, can I ask some questions? Yes, uh, please. So, so Eric, um, you've just been to D.C. What, what, what are your lessons from D.C.? <laughs> uh, so, we, we, the AMC meeting just in, is this still going on or is, <laughs> it's, I left, so I, I don't know if it was, it's still going probably, on. Probably today's uh, day, yeah. So I, on on uh, Sunday, I did a talk on a panel uh, at the AMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges. Uh, it, it, it was the panel was focused on healthcare reform and how research can inform uh, patient experience, uh, the health of populations. Uh, we talked about the work we're doing on the South Side. And, and also some of the things we're doing jointly. Uh, actually, you know, to a room of maybe about 300 yeah. plus people. It was a really nice crowd. Uh, you know, and I ended up getting approached by the University of Michigan and other uh, major academic centers trying to understand more about what we're doing. Uh, I then uh, the next day went to meet with the folks at, at HRSA uh, that oversee the the fairly qualified health centers. And the, th the way you, you're presenting, the way we're thinking about our Southside Healthcare Collaborative, where there are 33 community health centers working collaboratively with us and other hospitals on the South Side, is where they're trying to move. So, you know, it was clear to me after spending, I was supposed to be there an hour, I spent two and a half hours with them, that, uh, that, that they think there's some fertile ground and they, weren't, they were asking about, were we affiliated with your, you know, our effort? Uh, because I, I don't know if you all had just been there the day before or whatever. Uh, I also spent some time with the, the the folks from the Congressional Black Caucus. They have a, a health brain trust uh, and uh, a group that of of congresspersons who bring together uh, innovative folks in healthcare twice a year. And so I, I know we're, we've gotten invited and hope to have Dorian Miller and some of her work. Uh, just recently with the community on mental health and, and a play that Dorian wrote uh, and uh, and you know community participants participated in and brought the best of the cutting-edge mental health services uh, or I should say evidence-based uh, mental health as well as the resources that are available in our community so they were really jazzed about uh, that and uh, want us to have Dorian and some others uh, come make a presentation in April of next year. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to go to the meeting with you to Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation, but uh, it's clear we're, we're in the right spot for where health care reform is going. The, the other person I, I met when I was in D.C. was uh, 
Don Weaver, who's the head of the National Health, National Health Service Corps. Um, our REACH program, which you know, pays about $40,000 a year for each of four years for our graduates who practice in, in this network of clinics, uh, was something he was excited about because it, it dealt not only with primary care but also uh, with subspecialty care. Uh, um, Holly Humphrey presented a paper at the AAMC meeting uh, that also was well received about reach. So, so I, you know, I, I think that uh, between Tulsa, our work, New Orleans, uh, LA, you know, we're we're in the sweet spot of where healthcare yeah. reform is going. Yeah, I think so too. That, that was one of the things that I've really noticed is that the at the AAMC this year there was a real energy about about medical schools playing leadership roles in improving the health disparities. It, it, it was stronger than ever, stronger than ever that I've ever been in. I've, I've been going to AAMC now for 14 years, and clearly there's a swing as far as national intention of medical schools to play a role. Yeah. I, I, think, uh, I think this has been a wonderful discussion, great questions, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you again so much for coming up. Thank you.